everyone. Um, thank you very much for attending this joint talk um, between the Rural Computing Research Consortium and the Quello Center for Media Information Policy. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Gene Hardy, and I'm the director of the Rural Computing Research Consortium and a little bit of your host today um, for this talk. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Keith Hampton and Ashley Wilson for helping with this and asking me to co-sponsor. Um, I'm joined here today in the Quello Center conference room at MSU by graduate students from, um, from Edgerton University in Injaro, Kenya. Um, these students are joining us as part of a uh, Mozilla Foundation funded course that's led by Dr. Susan Weish that's bringing together students from um, Edgerton University and students from MSU um, on a course revolving around um, African studies and human-centered design and what the sort of future of those disciplines could look like together. Um, but we're here today to welcome Dr. Rob McMahon for his talk, Digital NWT, co-designing community networking literacies with rural, remote, northern indigenous communities in Northwest Territories, Canada. Um, Dr. McMahon is an associate professor in the Media and Technology Studies Unit in the Department of Political Science and the Faculty of Arts at the University of Alberta. His research focuses on the development, adoption, and use of broadband and internet technologies by rural, northern, and indigenous communities. His approach involves working with communities in all stages of the research, and he is in, and his partners are also involved in efforts to contribute to digital policy and regulation in Canada. Um, as an aside from the sort of formal biographical statement, um, I really appreciate Rob's dedication to doing community-centered work that takes a sort of necessary time and sort of long-term dedicated um, community partnerships um, to, to make it happen. Um, and I look forward to hearing much more about the, uh, the ongoing work um, in the talk today. So with that, I'm going to just ask everybody to please welcome Dr. Rob McMahon. Welcome. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the warm welcome. Nice to see you. Greetings from Canada um, and happy spring. Yeah, snow's melted and spring's on the way. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity to present today. So uh, what I'll do is I'll share my screen here. I've got a set of slides and um, just uh, if somebody could give me a thumbs up to make sure you can see it as a full screen. All good. OK, wonderful. Um, okay, so today I'll be speaking about um, a project. I'm I'm just one member of a, a group of uh, people involved in this project, um, and uh, it it's uh, called Digital NWT. It's focused on um, different aspects of community. Well, not just community networking literacies, but digital literacies um, in um, collaboration with various partners in the Northwest Territory. So that's sort of the Western Arctic section of Canada, and I'll be talking a little bit more about about that geography for people who may not be aware of it. Um, but just to start, um, the orientation of this work is around the social shaping of technology. Um, so, you know, that idea that technology isn't just something that's fixed, that's static, um, you know, that it just changes on its own behalf, either following science or of its own accord. Really, that type of, of approach promotes a passive attitude to techno technological change. But Underlying all of our work is this idea that, you know, we're not looking at just how to adapt to technological change, but rather how to shape it, how to actively be involved in its development, adoption, and use. Um, and as well, we draw a lot on Indigenous scholars. So I've got a quote here from uh, Marissa Duarte, uh, talking about how Native and Indigenous peoples leverage information and technology in different ways that subvert the legacies and ongoing processes of colonialism. So that's really like a one of the principles underlying um, the work that we're doing here. Uh, I'm a non-Indigenous person. I'm a settler scholar based uh, in Canada and really have the privilege of working with Indigenous colleagues, whether scholars, students, and community members who have really taught me so much about uh, some of these embedded assumptions and biases in the ways that we uh, have historically designed and adopted and used information and communication technologies. Um, so we're working together in order to surface those issues and then uh, figure out ways to redesign things in ways that are more supportive of, of Indigenous digital self-determination and sovereignty. Um, so I also draw on work um, from scholars like Susan Kretschmer talking about how do we adapt uh, our study and practice of digital divides uh, through the lens of the social construction of technology and social shaping of technology theories. Um, so just uh, to kind of help orient this work, I have a few uh, summaries of, of this type of approach. So really this idea that technology is socially shaped, but it also shapes the, the activities and actions of individuals, groups, and society as a whole. Um, that idea that technology creates an environment that both enables and or constrains designers and users. 
Um, cultural, organizational, institutional, economic, and political factors all impact the social and technological context of development or what we might think of as innovation. Um, and then that also includes different values and interests that might guide the design, diffusion, and adoption of technology. And this really points us to the fact that there are many different paths and possibilities, both conscious and unconscious, in the way, ways that we think about technological innovation. And this also highlights the different choices that are inherent in the design of technologies and the paths of innovation. So these kind of points, um, again, drive like both our community engagement work, as well as our ongoing research and learning activities, teaching and learning activities with the communities that we work with. Um, I'm also uh, influenced by um, work uh, around digital inclusion um, and really this movement between, um, you know, that idea of digital divides as sort of a deficit based approach that communities or individuals or groups are on the wrong side of the digital divide and they're somehow lacking, um, but rather shifting that focus in terms of more asset based approaches, focusing on the strengths of those communities, individuals and groups. And really focusing on what's possible as we look to bridge those divides and support digital equity and inclusion. Um, so I draw upon uh, Rise Doris and Ryan Smith here who talk about focusing really on what's possible rather than what's missing. And that helps us provide a unique and refreshing perspective that enables researchers to move beyond what the problem is and toward identifying potential solution uh, in regard to increasing digital inclusion. Um, so with respect to how we go about community-based digital equity or digital inclusion research, um, in partnership with the groups we work with, we really focus on identifying and utilizing community resources and expertise. So how is that reflected in our work? So actually I'm presenting alone here, but typically I would be presenting with a community partner. Um, so I do a lot of presentations, whether it's at um, in classes, I will bring in people to speak about their experience and we kind of have a dialogue there. Or if it's an academic conference, we would maybe have a panel that would um, have sort of some researchers, quote unquote, traditional academic university research researchers, but also experts from the community, whether they're indigenous elders or, or practitioners who are working on building and sustaining uh, community networks and so on. Uh, and that's also reflected in the, the works that we publish. So um, typically there would be a long list of people uh, involved in the byline, and that's because these projects are very sort of um, collaborative and participatory. So we always uh, seek to acknowledge like our co-authors and our, our community members, as well as those who are uh, doing the writing and the documentation. Uh, we also work with community organizations to make sure we're sharing the benefits of the researchers in a reciprocal way. Uh, this follows some insights from indigenous research methodologies really focused on reciprocal relations uh, in the in the research context so whether that's stories about the types of projects people are involved in uh, public outreach about what they're doing or even uh, leveraging some of the research for policy and regulatory interventions um, so we kind of have different audiences for our research so of course we seek to publish in academic journals but we also seek to develop um, you know, policy or regulatory interventions and in various proceedings, such as with our uh, Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission in Canada, uh, which is like the FCC in the US. Uh, and then also what I'll talk about today is different resources that we develop um, in partnership with our, our community partners, such as different toolkits um, or digital literacy workshops or so on. Um, I also wanted to stress that uh, in this type of work, um, really long-term engagement is absolutely essential. Um, we really wanna make sure that these projects are reflecting and supporting the aspirations of the citizens, thinking back to that social shaping approach and also the approach to digital equity and inclusion I mentioned earlier. Um, so a lot of this work involves identifying and debating different development goals through structured dialogue with our community partners, thinking through together things like you know, how is digital connectivity built? How is it set up? Who owns it? How is it paid for? How is it distributed, managed, used in and across different communities and regions? Um, how different digital resources can deliver essential public services or support digital economies? And then also how is digital literacy developed and delivered, which is one of the things I'll focus on today. 
Um, so I've kind of given you an overall orientation of the type of work we do. And now I'll kind of move into the specific context of which this work is taking place. Um, so this is uh, an area now uh, known as the Northwest Territories in Canada. You can see uh, this map here on the top left. Here we have the US, Canada, Alaska. You can see here the NWT is sort of the Western Arctic region. Uh, we have one more smaller uh, Arctic territory, Northern Territory called the Yukon. Um, and then on the east, we have that large area, which is Nunavut. Um, so a lot of this work that we're doing is focused on sort of this uh, area, the NWT, or as it's known uh, by uh, Inuvialuit people, Inuvinetiak, or Denede by the Dene Nation. Um, and this is quite a, a complex territory, like all territories, right? Um, but with respect to the types of groups living here, who've been here long before Canada was <laughs> established, um, so you can see here in the bottom part of this map, these are the different um, uh, groups like up here in the north, you have the Inuit, the Inuvialuit, this is the Western uh, Inuit peoples. Um, kind of around here, this is the Gwich'in or Din uh, Dinjiza people. And then as you move down, you have the Satu, Dene, and, and different groups here. So these are different um, uh, indigenous nations as well as land claim groups, um, which all have their own um, uh, their own kind of uh, political structures, their own sort of Aboriginal and treaty rights. They they have their own forms of uh, delivering healthcare, public services, you know, education, that kind of thing. Um, and then just so you get a sense of the land itself, uh, this is the Dempster Highway. So this kind of starts in Whitehorse, which is in it's the capital of the Yukon region, and then it goes up to if you can see Inuvik there. It's not a little star, um, so it kind of ends up in Inuvik. So it's this Kind of dirt road it's an absolutely incredible drive uh you can do it um in about 16 hours or so and because there's 24 hours sunlight you can even do it in a day if you're really going for it um but it kind of goes through this area and then up through some mountains and then levels out through uh uh through the northern arctic region here past the tree line past the arctic circle and so on uh and then the people are are very engaged in uh cultural activities so this is Tanya Larson at a hide tanning camp. Um, she creates jewelry. Um, so she creates and sells jewelry uh, and participates in these types of activities in the North. And then here, I'll talk a bit more about this later, but this is actually a fiber optic um, uh, trench, uh, trenching system in sort of the Southern part of the territories in Catladeche First Nation. So many technological projects as well as uh, many exciting projects around cultural uh, activities and language and cultural revitalization. Um, this is sort of an eastern part of the Arctic, but I wanted to show some photos of what some of these small flying communities are like. Um, so I will say that in terms of transportation, um, outside of the major capitals or the hub cities, these are very small population uh, communities, some of them just a few hundred people. Um, oftentimes there's no year round road access. So people either rely on fly in, um, you know, intermittent flights, uh, you know, a couple of times a day, or sometimes you would get a barge that comes in once the ice is broken up to deliver supplies. Or in some cases there's winter roads. So I don't know if you've ever seen that show ice road truckers, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have that in the U S but that's kind of a reality show about the truckers that are delivering, um, uh, you know, food and so on across these ice roads that they build in the wintertime. Um, so this is a Vujovic. You can see here, uh, just to get a sense of what the, the actual community looks like and the vastness of the land around it. Um, and here, this uh, on the far right is the, uh, what they call the Canadian Tire. This is sort of the Walmart of the community. Um, people, you know, really well organized um, in terms of old, uh, uh, this is skidoos, and they would have ATVs, different vehicles, so people would go there to get spare parts in order to fix their, uh, you know, fix their vehicles and so on, because it's so expensive and limited in terms of getting brick and mortar goods, right? You can't just uh, order things on Amazon, right? Like they have to wait for that uh, barge that comes up or, or, uh, or a flight or so on to bring in physical materials. Um, and then I would just say in terms of electricity and communications infrastructure, Oftentimes, these are diesel burning communities. There's been experiments with renewable energy, um, but it's not uh, connected to the main grid in Canada. Um, and then similarly, with respect to access to backhaul connectivity, 
Um, oftentimes they're relying on uh, satellite backhaul. Um, there's not too many, um, some fixed wireless radio towers and uh, some moves towards fiber optic backhaul, but still quite disconnected from the broader internet. Um, so I'm gonna take us back to uh, internet connectivity sort of at the time of this project. So this was from 2021. And you can see here, um, this is our regulators uh, uh, review of what the uh, coverage is of the 50 megabit per second down, 10 megabit per second uh, up, unlimited broadband coverage. And the North, about 50% of it covered. And then First Nation areas around 43%. I would say in the Northwest Territories, the numbers are much lower because as I mentioned, you have sort of centralized hub communities and then you've got those very small communities that are dispersed over wider geographic spaces, very low population. So there's also gaps, not just between the North and South parts of Canada, but also within the North between more rural, remote and more sort of centralized um, urban communities. We also see uh, gaps in affordability. Um, this is just a comparison between Alberta and the North. You can see here pricing almost double, uh, $150 per month versus uh, you know, about $75 Canadian per month. So kind of within this context, um, you know, we had this uh, you know, quite significant aspects of digital access divides, digital affordability divides, but we did know that um, there were moves to connect these communities. Um, so there was a significant government funding to improve backhaul. Um, so they had a regional fiber optic link that was going in to connect um, many of these smaller communities that were accessible through those ice roads. Um, so we knew that extremely fast, lower cost that hypothetically would be coming soon. And so we were approached by some of these uh, Indigenous groups to work with them to develop some digital literacy programming because uh, they knew sort of they would be going from limited connectivity to almost a fire hose of, of band bandwidth and data coming. So um, around 2017, we, we worked with them to develop some early stage di digital literacy workshops um, with the, the Gwich'in Tribal Council Department of Cult Cultural Heritage. <laughs> And so we worked with the, uh, the group there to combine these workshops with participatory research. Um, so we kind of did some uh, early stage research around planning and contextualizing and delivering the workshop content. And they were really interested in using this newly available technology and connectivity to archive, share, preserve, and digitize Indigenous knowledge. Um, but they also really wanted an introduction to broadband in the North. Um, and as I mentioned, that that regional fiber optic link called the Mackenzie Valley Fiber Link that would be coming. Um, so we held some uh, pilot workshops up in Inuvik, um, which is kind of a hub within the, the western part of the Northwest Territories. So we brought in people from the smaller communities and then held a one day workshop where we focused the morning on kind of digital connectivity. What, what does it mean for them? What, what's coming? Introduction to broadband and so on. And then the afternoon more on the digital content side. Uh, and then develop some open educational resources around that. Uh, then they invited us back the following year and they said, okay, well, rather than have people come to you in Inuvik, can you go to the communities and then deliver similar content, but kind of scale it up a little bit. So rather than have one day, break it out into two days uh, with one focused on connectivity and one focused on content. So we ended up going on a, a it was an amazing field trip. We got to go for two weeks. Uh, we drove up that Dempster Highway that I showed you. Uh, we visited three different communities um, and hosted these workshops with folks there and really expanding on that pilot that we did in 2017 with more hands-on activities, content, and examples. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples here on the right. Um, this first part was around basic uh, ideas around building out a digital library. So we had people learn a little bit about data, right? Um, taking a photo of an object, digit, digitalizing it, then assigning basic metadata to it to create a record, and then organizing that into a basic database or catalog. Um, so they kind of go through that process of, of basic data management. Um, and then on the bottom, we developed a, a hands-on activity called Make the Network, where we had 3D printed pieces that show different 
aspects of uh, a community, um, different broadband users. So you can see here the pieces being things like somebody's home or where the local nursing station was or where the school was. And then we printed out maps of each of the communities and we give people these 3D, 3D printed pieces and say, okay, put your house on the map, put the nursing station on the map. And they kind of build a bit of a map of, of what the key broadband uh, anchor tenants and, and users would be. And then we would hand them a, a piece of, uh, of yarn and say, okay, connect up the community. And we had different infrastructure pieces, uh, nodes, a point of presence and so on. And then we had the, the participants build a basic community network and then we use that to illustrate um, basic design principles around redundancy and resiliency of networks and so on. So you can see here, this is an early stage version of this mapping project. So we've kind of pilot tested in the communities there. Uh, and then we built out um, a student workbook and a facilitator handbook. So if anybody's interested in learning more, you can download these. Uh, I put links in um, to the presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, the, uh, the digital content activity, uh, the Make the Network con Connectivity uh, activity. And then we also really wanted to ground this in the history of uh, the Gwich'in peoples or the Dinjiza peoples. So we did a little bit of a history of their um, activities over the years in terms of storytelling and media, talking about, um, you know, sort of pre-colonial uh, activities as well as community radio and now going up to digital forms of, of uh, communication. Uh, and then we also started uh, highlighting Northern digital innovators as success stories. So once that, <laughs> excuse me, concluded, um, we heard, started hearing from other groups in the North and saying, hey, is there a way to scale up this project across the territories? Can we work with you to, to further this? And one of our partners uh, there is Aurora College, which is a post-secondary institution there. And they have a series of uh, adult educators that teach uh, adult learners in each of the communities, um, things like uh, high school upgrades or different types of courses that people may want to take um, what, without leaving the community. So they have community learning centers. So we thought, you know, can we par partner with you and then take this content, refine it, and then um, have it taught by these adult educators for free to people in the communities. Um, so we worked with different uh, Indigenous partners and kind of um, decided, okay, let's develop some, some courses uh, that could be taught by these adult educators in the communities. So we received some funding from the Government of Canada through the Digital Literacy Exchange Program to do this. Um, and really our focus was to adopt a train-the-trainer approach. So we would work with these adult educators um, in order to, as well as community members, in order to co-design different digital literacy resources, and then provide that training to participants in the communities for free. Um, and then in terms of the, the types of topics we focused on, it ranged from very basic activities. We heard people asking, you know, how do you attach a, a photo to an email, right? People have very uh, introductory level uh, digital literacy skills, all the way to people asking, hey, how do I build a community network? Um, so we chose to try to um, focus on this range of, of digital skills and, and interests of people. So we did everything from how to browse the internet and stay secure online to more creative aspects such as digital storytelling, data collection, and community networks. Um, so I just wanted to stress that all of this curriculum, we worked with our community partners to do peer review. So we really wanted to make sure it was relevant and interesting for people in the communities. So we recruited both the adult educators and then some end learners, some folks living in the communities of different ages, whether they were youth or elders or so on. And then they gave us uh, feedback on the courses. Is it relevant to me? Is it interesting? Is it kind of hitting the right um, level of, uh, of interest for us? Um, another really key lesson we learned was the importance of building a community. Of course, we're Southern-based researchers. We're not from the community. We're, um, we did have some Indigenous grad students from the community, but many of us were not Indigenous. Um, so really, we focused on this idea of building a community using social media, online coaching, and train-the-trainer workshops um, to really kind of share that capacity, um, both their expertise on the the local context in the North, and then what we were bringing with respect to our research and, and kind of curriculum activities. 
Um, and then this was supplemented by local surveys that we did where we were trying to assess people's uh, self-reported digital literacy assessments and so on. Um, so we trained and hired local researchers that went door to door in the communities um, and then collected data for us, shared it with us. And then that in turn helped us, uh, uh, helped inform the development of, of the curriculum that we were doing. So I'll just give you an example of what these kind of train the trainer workshops were like. Um, so in Inuvik in 2019, we brought the different adult educators from the communities to a central hub and then we really asked them, you know, what does digital literacy mean to you? How can it respond to needs of people in the North? Um, so you can see here, we did a, a bit of a session here talking about these issues. <laughs> so part of it was around collecting information about their, their uh, suggestions, advice, and so on. But we also really wanted to get them excited about digital literacy. And we thought a good way to do that would be to work through a creative activity. Um, so you can see here in the bottom, what we did was uh, on the second day, we had them actually go from, uh, we wanted them to create and share digital stories. So they went through the different stages within that. Um, so they ended up like scripting, um, doing a basic script about, you know, what digital literacy means to them, why they think it's important for folks in the Northwest Territories. Then they picked photos. Sometimes they took photos on site. Um, and then uh, pick some open access music and then edited that together on site and then uploaded that to YouTube. So now we have a series of these very short um, digital stories that the adult educators made. And I think that really helped like by focusing on the creative activity, it really helped get them excited about the possibility of this type of program and how easy it was um, to create and share these things and also how low cost, right? We really tried to focus on low cost tools and then free or low cost software. Um, so here are some of the uh, photos of the courses we delivered in the communities. You can notice everybody's wearing masks. Uh, so COVID threw us for a bit of a loop. We couldn't actually go there ourselves. Um, of course, that was a big challenge in terms of how do you manage a program like this from uh, Edmonton and Urban Center in the South. But, you know, really it pushed us to recognize that, you know, it's not really us delivering this program, but how do we support the folks in the communities to deliver it themselves? So even though it was, uh, I lost a lot of my hair there, I got a little stressed out uh, in terms of not being able to be on site, um, that really helped us uh, focus on how do we share that capacity? How do we bring these resources or work with people who have these resources? And then they actually take on the program and teach it in the communities. I'll just point out that top uh, uh, image there. Remember I showed you an earlier prototype of the network, um, building the network model. This is like a later, more refined version of that. Uh, and then finally, we were measuring impacts of these courses. And I'll just show these uh, numbers here because, um, you know, of course you want people to have that, that level of understanding. We were looking at different ped pedagogical uh, indicators. So levels of understanding, levels of confidence, and then intention to act or behavioral indicators. Um, but I was like really, really proud of this fact of confidence levels. So you can see here on the bottom, right? Like these are people living in very small communities, um, oftentimes marginalized with respect to uh, the South and, and main, mainstream Canadian society. Uh, and you can see here, this is confidence levels were reflected before they took the workshop. So higher, you know, it is distributed across one to 10 and you did have some higher levels of, of self-reported confidence in activities like using the internet or using social media, but less so in terms of keeping data secure online or managing information uh, available about you. Um, and you can see here, we did like a simple pre and post intervention set of surveys. So people filled out surveys immediately before the course and then immediately after. And then we see that shift to higher levels of confidence afterwards. Um, so that was a really um, exciting thing for us to see. Um, okay, so I've talked about the digital literacy resources. I did wanna talk a little bit as well about some of the advocacy work that's kind of connected to this. So as I mentioned, like these communities have faced a significant digital divide for many years um, and policymakers were focusing on it um, at this time. However, they had very limited data available from these very small population communities. 
Um, so there was kind of a gap in terms of the evidence available for policymakers in terms of what it's actually like on the ground in the communities. Um, so we worked with these um, the adult educators and the end learners to actually collect data themselves on what their circumstances are. Um, so we did this through different digital tools. So you can see here, this is a user-based internet performance test. I'm sure most people are aware of the MLab system. So this is kind of a Canadian adaption of the MLab system by the Canadian Internet uh, Registration Authority. Um, and then we also did things like uh, online workshops that showed people how do you collect and report data about your internet services to the regulator, which is kind of an opaque process if you haven't uh, engaged in it before. Um, and so at this time, there were consultations being held specifically about telecom in Northern Canada. And as I mentioned, very limited data from the perspective of people living there. Um, so the regulator was asking, we want to know more about how the telecom needs of Canadians living in these areas are being met to ensure that all Canadians have access to high, high quality internet. Um, so if you're a client of Northwest Tel is the main incumbent providing services there, we would like to know what you think about uh, the quality of your services. Are they accessible, affordable, or reliable? So this was a formal policy consultation taking place kind of the same time as we were doing this project. Um, so what we did was figure out ways uh, to engage Northerners to monitor and evaluate their services. So uh, they can engage in online data collection and present information about their own experiences in communities. And there's different ways that they can do this, right? So as I mentioned, they do those door-to-door -door household surveys. So we developed these kits using free open access uh, software, the Open Data Kit. Um, and then uh, an Android tablet, and then people could do offline surveys, go to door to door in their communities, and then share that data with us uh, down at the U of A for interpretation. Um, of course, that digital storytelling as well is very powerful. Um, so people created digital stories talking about their own experiences with connectivity or lack thereof in their communities. Uh, and then as well, that internet performance test. So user side performance monitoring. So different ways to engage folks in these remote communities using digital tools that then could be uh, presented back to policymakers. Uh, this is just a summary of those door-to-door -door surveys. So we did two rounds of surveys in 2020, 21, and 2021, 20, 22. So about 500 households representing about 1,600 or so people. Um, we also did a set of uh, text message surveys, so about 350 there. And we asked people, you know, do you have internet in your home? So you can see here quite a large uh, percentage of folks said that they did not have household internet, uh, even more in, in terms of the folks we, uh, we uh, connected with in the second year. Uh, and then we asked, you know, if you do not have home internet, why is that? And you can see here in both cases, more than half of the respondents said, if they said that they do not have home internet, it's because it's too expensive or unaffordable. Uh, so then we took those findings and presented them back to the policymakers. So there was a public hearing held in April in, in uh, Whitehorse. Um, and this was a hybrid panel featuring the, the digital stories I mentioned that folks had created talking about their experience, as well as policy recommendations that drew from the surveys and the internet speed test. So we presented back that information back to the, the policymakers in that, during that hearing. Okay, so sort of the second half of my talk here, um, I wanna go into a specific project around um, digital innovation in the Northwest Territories. And as I mentioned, we really wanted these digital literacy resources to be relevant and interesting for people in the North. So we tried to focus on different projects that they were already involved in. Um, for example, JC here has a Speak uh, Gwich and to Me um, campaign on social media around sort of reclaiming and, and revitalizing the Gwich'in language. Um, this is Sidoni Okina. She, she worked with the Internet Society to try to set up a community network in her small community of Uluhaktak. So we would kind of showcase these folks within the, the digital literacy resources of, of examples of youth and others who are involved in innovation. But today I'll talk really specifically around community networks uh, and this idea of community networking uh, literacy. So, for those who may not be aware of what community networks are, 
Um, oftentimes they emerge from necessity. So this is this idea that um, individuals and groups who've been excluded from or who are beholden to those large commercial telecom networks um, kind of take on the idea of building, deploying, managing infrastructure themselves. Um, so they're building these, these networks. They might be localized networks. They can extend out to regional networks. We have many examples of regional community networks, but typically they're designed, built, and operated by and for the communities that they serve. Um, and I'll just stress that there's a large social component to this work. So really they can coalesce a community around shared desires and experiences, as well as frustrations around barriers to internet affordability and accessibility. So we thought this might be of interest to folks in the North that told us they were frustrated with the lack of connectivity in their communities. Uh, there are many examples of community, community networks extending back to the early days of the internet, the free nets, for example. Um, and they're also uh, international in scope and scale. So we have some here in Canada, but of course in the US, you've got Detroit, you've got uh, you know, NYC Nash, Nash in, in New York, we've got Toronto, Cape Town in Africa, different rural areas, right? In Mexico, Argentina, South Africa, and then in Europe as well. Um, so you have different articulations of these community networks, whether they're rural, urban, whether they're in Europe, Canada, Africa, et cetera, right? So, um, it's it's uh, uh, many examples of this type of work happening across the world. Um, and then within Canada, you have quite a movement of Indigenous community networks. Um, and in this case, they're really positioned as a means for Indigenous parties to exercise autonomy and sovereignty over uh, the network infrastructure, as well as over the services they deliver. Um, so really reorienting that, that process of technological innovation beyond discourses and processes tied to modernization, technology transfer, and kind of reorienting it towards localized conceptions of territory-centered or cultural-centered projects that are really rooted in those local contexts. Um, so one example from the Northwest Territories is the Catladeche Community Fiber Network. So this is the territories. Remember I talked about the Mackenzie Valley fiber link. That's this link here in red. And you can see here that they were kind of left off of that infrastructure. So Caledache is a reserve outside of Hay River community. Um, and so a young uh, entrepreneur there actually took on um, a project of, of trenching fiber optic cables, hiring people in the community. And you can see here the challenges, right? Like. This is trying to dig into uh, ground that's as hard as cement um, because of the, uh, the temperature and so on. Their trenching tool broke. Um, so you could imagine they had to wait until the next year for the equipment to be shipped up to, in order to continue the project. Um, but they ended up installing um, fiber optic cables within the community there. Um, so Steve Song has done some really great work on different supports and barriers to the development of community networks. Um, we are seeing that there are supports now in terms of uh, increasing open access to fiber, the availability of unlicensed spectrum, low cost equipment, open source hardware and software, and so on. But we are still um, also experiencing barriers to the development of community networks. Um, and as well as technical and economic barriers, really our focus was on the social barriers. So the lack of awareness of the opportunity and relative ease of deployment of community networks, and then limited technical expertise in which to take on these projects. Uh, and then also governance issues such as who owns and controls the projects. Um, so that was really where we saw, okay, if we're gonna look at community networks, let's take a look at these social aspects. Um, and then this turns us to looking at a specific type of digital literacy. So this idea of infrastructural literacies, right? Um, oftentimes digital literacy assumes that learners already have access to connectivity. So we're working in an environment in a context where people don't actually even have uh, adequate access to the underlying connectivity. And when they do, it's typically unreliable or expensive. So we decided to focus on, well, how are, community connect, or how are community communities connected? Why and what does that mean for the folks on the ground in the communities? Um, so this draws on some of Lisa Park's work. Um, she writes that there's a tendency to overlook the uniqueness of particular nodes in a network 
their physical form, the stories of their development, or the practices that surround them once they're activated. So we're really looking at that material development of these community networks as a form of digital infrastructure literacy. So if we want to co-design different forms of, of community networking literacy, um, you know, to be sustainable, we really want to make sure they're contextually relevant to communities, right? So for example, people living in these communities might choose to balance connectivity challenges with land-based living specific to their place and community. Just checking here. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, uh, one moment here. I'm just, there we go. Uh, okay. I should be able to wrap up in 10 here. Um, so what we drew on was Wacoma's Nimble Kits. Uh, so this is a, a, a mesh networking kit that was developed by an organization called Wacoma. Um, that's an offline first system that can operate kind of out of the box, uh, independent of the wider internet. So I'll just talk a little bit about this and what we've learned. Um, uh, so our plan for the community networking course was that people would build a small scale network, a wireless mesh network using those kits, and then share local connectivity and content through unlicensed spectrum. Um, so you can see here, this is a diagram of this type of networking system. So you have the kit here, um, here's an access point, and then you can connect to different houses and then uh, individual users would then connect to that mesh system. Um, so the growing of these net local access points would enable the expansion of the mesh network and provide local access to open source applications over the system. So we were interested in what ways can the social and technical aspects of community mesh, mesh networking be adapted for people in NWT communities. And we looked at this through different workshops and semi-structured interviews with participants. Um, because of COVID, we had to do this all online. Um, so we tried to uh, involve people from different communities. This, this map here shows the different communities involved in this design process. And then we met over Zoom in a virtual co-design space. Um, and so we held a series of workshops in that co-design space. So people had these innovation hubs in their communities. And then we kind of met and went through a series of discussion questions and activities online. Um, so you can see here, this is an example of uh, them actually building out those kits. So we sent like kind of, you know, in Ikea, when you go and you want to build a bed or something and you get like your instructions and pieces, a little kit. So we did a version of that for these mesh networking kits. And then we sent it up to people in the communities. We met over Zoom and then we built it together. So here you have the pieces on this photo. And then over here is a finished kit. So I'll try and go through this quickly, but please flag me if I uh, only have a few minutes left. Um, we did intake interviews. Um, really, again, this is about the expertise of folks in the communities telling us what how to guide the development of this process. Um, they really stressed the importance of context. Um, they wanted the project to respond to the, the limitations of connectivity, contribute to local empowerment, make sure we clarify the ownership and control of the networks, and then really some support remote coordination because of the geographic distances between the communities and the high cost of travel. Um, and I just stress here that many people adopted a critical stance even from the start asking, you know, why, how, and for what purposes should communities be connected? Who benefits from this connectivity? So that was really central to our process. Um, I think this is a key uh, aspect of this project is we wanted to communicate what com community networks are to folks that may not have any technical background in what these were. Um, so we did some research to figure out what's a similar institution or organization that, that we could use as an analogy for a community network. Um, so we showed people images of these uh, community freezers. So in many of these communities, you would have a communally organized freezer where people go out and fish and hunt and so on, and then put the the meat or the fish or so on in this freezer, and then people can come and get it as needed. So it's kind of a communally organized sharing system. So we thought, you know, this could be similar to community networks, like um, everybody collectively organizes it. And the, the instead of meat or fish, it's like the data that gets shared locally. And then everybody has access to that according to um, different rules around stewardship and access and so on. Um, and we, we did find that while this 
analogy resonated with most people. It's very context dependent because in some cases, these community freezer projects actually failed in the communities. And so it kind of um, uh, set the project up for failure because people were already attaching it to something that had been tried in the past and did not work out. Um, so that was kind of a warning to us to make sure that when you're communicating about these types of projects, make sure you do that initial discussion to make sure that it's something that resonates as a success for people rather than something that had already been coded as a failure. Um, I mentioned that, uh, you know, that Ikea building the back black box. So we mailed up um, uh, the kits to people. We had like a, a really fun session where online we all built them together and showed people like the actual uh, hardware. And the idea there was demystifying the black box, showing people these are the pieces that make up the internet physically. And let's actually build it ourselves from this pile of, of stuff, right? Um, uh, I'll just go through these very quickly. Um, the second piece was just around customizing the interface. Similarly, we wanted to open up the black box of what the software was, what the interface was. And so we showed people what some of the online um, uh, open source applications they could use, and then showed them how we would build out the actual interface that end users would use to connect to this networking system. So the landing page and so on. I can talk more about this if anybody has any questions. Um, I'm gonna go through these extremely quickly. <laughs> um, this was just uh, in terms of how do we install and configure the kits. That was kind of done all online. Um, unfortunately, rather than have the people in the communities actually install and configure thing, things themselves, because of the technical nature of the activity, we had to have it as a more centralized process. Um, so that kind of limited that participation and input of the participants in the hubs. Um, then we tested out the apps with folks. Um, and then finally, we developed some administration and, and governance rules. So we had like a stewardship agreement that we, it's kind of like a basic terms of service. Um, so we kind of workshop that with people to um, go through the steps involved in how do you um, set up terms and service for this type of small scale community network. We thought that was also an important thing to go through. Um, and that responded to their um, request to focus on administration, ownership, and control of the kits. Um, finally, we did some post-workshop interviews and reflections. Um, we heard from people that the timing was really challenging because we were designing these kits at the same time we were engaging them. There are kind of gaps between the workshops, um, as well as the logistics of trying to manage things online. Some of the content was highly technical. Um, and some people didn't feel comfortable or confident explaining what the networking system was or how it could be used, even at the end of going through all these workshops. So that was a real eye opener for us about the uh, technical aspects of this. Three minutes. OK, you bet. Um, so yeah, just. Uh, for example, one of the participants saying, you know, the workshop was great. It told us about the parts and stuff like that, how to put it together. But then we were left with all these wires and we didn't really know what, where they went. Um, so I think unless the person actually walked us through that process, I didn't really get it. Um, however, aspects of the process did help participants reimagine infrastructure and really helped open up that black box. So they found that the, the concept of the community networks really helped them understand what the internet is, and especially that building the black box exercise about the physical uh, devices. Um, they really liked the social aspect of that, and they really liked how that demystified what the backbone or the material aspects of the internet are. Um, the final point being, others noted that being forced to physically interact with the kids increased their confidence and made, they made the process of building a community network more tangible. So as one person said, if you guys have been able to come up here, you might have been a whole lot more hands-on and we would have just sat back and let you do things. Um, so by having them do it, it drove us to try things that we might have just sat back and let you do it. It's forcing us to build capacity here because either that or it just doesn't get done. Um, so just to conclude, our key insights um, being that, okay, well, it may be easy to point to immediate use cases of what a, a community network might be used for in a community, but that path towards how do they deploy it and how do they sustain it is still quite vague and really um, 
that was where we felt our focus should lie in community networking literacies. Um, so they noted that things like the hardware assembly workshop is a very powerful example of demystifying hardware and connectivity. So community net networking literacy initiatives really should cover the material aspects of network design and deployment. Um, secondly, we learned that even in the very small communities, you know, some of them less than 700 people, these types of literacies also take on local form. So things like metaphors, use cases, who the local champions might be, they all differed between the communities. So remember that example of the, the local community freezer. Um, so we really highlight that as an example of how important it is to uh, contextualize as much as possible these types of literacy activities. Uh, I'll just end here that Wacoma won the best overall proof of concept award for this system through the IEEE Connecting the Unconnected Challenge. And if you're interested, I know I had to skip over some of the data at the end, um, but if you're interested in learning more, there's an open access uh, article available in the C Journal of Commu Computer Mediated Communication. So I've added the link here too for folks who wanna read more into the details of the research. Um, so with that, I'll uh, end and uh, invite everybody questions. Thanks so much for the time to present today. Thank you so much, Rob. Fantastic.